You're listening to the Hawk Media Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and executives crush the digital marketing game. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. All right. You're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Spectacular Smith. How you doing, man? And I'm doing spectacular. (laughs) Gotta love it. So, you know, always love to start like, let's take this way back to, you know, childhood. Like, did you just come out, you were born and you decided I'm an entrepreneur and a music mogul and started managing people right away. Or like, take me back like three years old, four years old. Where are you from? How did it start? Born and raised in Miami. Yep. Started off entrepreneur. I would say in the third grade selling candy. So how'd that start? Like, were your parents super supportive or like, tell me about like the family life side of things. So my, my mom, she was always a hustler. My mom was always someone who, no matter what she did, she figured out a way to make money. She was a single mom, four kids. And yep. me seeing my mom grind the way she did, she did a lot of things. Like she even has felonies trying to do certain things to provide for us. And I seen the way that she hustled. Nothing, nothing held her back. She made sure she put food on the table every night, no matter what she had to do to do it. And I just respected my mom so much and just seeing the way that she was hustling. And she used to sell like Avon crystals. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but back in yeah. the day, they had these little crystals and stuff that that uh, that you can sell. And, and it was like the MLM type of strategy. Yeah. And I seen my mom hustling that. And I went to school one day and seen them have a brochure and you get all these different items that you can win. And I just got a competitive spirit. So even at third grade, I'm like, man, I want that. I want that. I want that. And, and they kept giving me boxes of candy and I kept selling them, kept selling them, kept selling them until I ended up selling like $10,000 worth of candy. It's like an eight year old, basically. Yeah, basically. (laughs) Right. And and, and my mom, I told my mom to help me out. I went door to door. I sold it to her friends. Like, and I just went crazy. And And it was just like a great experience for me at that age because I I realized that I could make money. But then when I went to go turn my money in for my prize, they literally gave me like a bubblegum beeper and a yo-yo. Like it was an outrageous (laughs) gift. And at that moment, I realized that I could never work for nobody. Yeah. Oh, so you were like, what are we like, again, eight years old and you're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I can't work for someone else. It was like, yeah, no, it wasn't necessarily me saying I'm not going to work for nobody. Yeah. At that age, it was more of I'm not doing that again. Right. I'm going to do this by myself. Yeah. Right now, me thinking back is me saying I'm not going to work for nobody. But at that time, in that age, I'm like, yo, I just got robbed. Right. I'm going to do this myself and I can buy more stuff with the money I get versus like what I got. So that's kind of like where it all started. In in, in the third grade, I was in a dance group too. Uh uh, Our our dance group name was Forever Nasty. Where'd that come from? We had an older group. Their name was Forever Nasty. So we was baby Forever Nasty. So <laughs> we was, uh, yeah, it was a Miami group, man. Back in back in the day, everything was about dancing and having fun. They call it booty shaking in Miami. And yeah. that was really our thing, man. So I love dancing just as much as I love making money. But yeah. my, my main passion at that time was dancing. I love going on stages, women screaming and, yeah. you know, snatching me off stage and it was just so much fun so that's kind of what a whole entrepreneur journey started yep and the entertainment started and so how did that progress so third grade what happened through like elementary school middle school you kept dancing did you start doing other entrepreneurial endeavors through that time yeah so i started off in middle school still in a dance group and when i went into the dance group, I kind of transit. And it's crazy, me even talking about it right now. I always had like business and entertainment side by side. So as I was in the dance group, I used to go to school and sell candy. And when I sold candy in the sixth grade, at this point, I needed more traction that I can, like I needed to bring more traction to the school. Because I used to bring like $45 bags of candy and I was all sold out of candy by the time I got to my third period. Yeah. to beg me like yo spec i thought you had candy i thought you had candy we had seven periods so imagine getting bugged for four more periods that yeah. i didn't have candy so i understood at the time in business you just got to solve a problem so every successful business solve a problem so i felt like that was a void i needed to fill yeah for periods 
if I had more candy, I would have made more money. So yep. I went around to school and I asked as many people as I could to see who would help me sell candy. I got 10 people to agree. I told them, I said, I give you $20 every single week if you help me sell candy. And I said, listen, if you sell out more than three times in one week, then I give you an extra $5. So now these are seven, six graders, eight graders, $20, $25 in a week. That was a lot of money, right? You yep. get your pizza, you get your juice, like yep. you could. And it was great because they met me at the side of the school, at the beginning of the school and at the end of the school uh, day. So I can give them the candy and then they can turn in my money. And, <laughs> and like I was making 1500 to $2,000 every single week. Wow. Yeah. And I was, I was freaking killing it, man. I was killing it. And it was, a, it was just a great experience to understand money, to understand product, to understand influence. I understood a lot of stuff at that age that I would have never really knew. And leveraging people. Like so many people never get to the step of hiring one person because they can't get out of their own way of like, well, that's going to lose me money. It's like, no, 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 no. I deal with that with like when we're building out teams in our own company where we give someone a PL and they're like, well, I don't want to hire anyone because then I'll just, that comes out of my cut. It's like, not if you get a lever on them, that's the whole point. Like that's how this works. So in sixth grade, you were figuring that out. Yes, yes. It, and and it, it did really well for me. And then at the point that I was making that much money, I was able to help my mom that she was struggling. We was getting evicted from house to house, section eight. And when I transitioned from, when my mom transitioned from being on section eight, to get removed off of Section 8 because of one of my family members said something to the government and got us snatched off. So now imagine having $28 rent to $1,500 rent. And yeah. we was already struggling getting evicted at $28. Yeah. Of rent. So I was happy that I can literally give back to my mom, seeing her crying some days and just wanting to figure out a way I can I can help. So at sixth grade, I was, I was helping paying bills. Wow. And that was... And how did your like friends react? Did they know how well you were doing? Did they know you're making thousands of dollars selling candy or were they kind of like, Oh, this guy's hustling. He's making some money. Yeah. In the sixth grade, it really wasn't, it really wasn't a thing. Yeah. Because all they cared about was the candy, right? I was yeah. the guy who had the resource of the good candy, the, yeah. the sour Skittles and the, the airheads and the Starburst and the Snicker bars. And M like, I was the guy when you randomly was hungry before vending machines was out. Yeah, this is before vending machines was really out like that in my school and I was supplying the candy. But the crazy thing is, that was the first time I ever got to put out of business because now I transitioned to high school. So now I'm still in a dance group and now I end up getting in a group. My brother's pretty Ricky. Yeah. And that's when my whole music journey started from my dad telling me to get in the group. And then I started opening up the same candy business because now I had to move with my dad because my dad forced me to come live with him and yeah. told my mom, a woman can't show a man how to become a man. So my mom told me, listen, go with your dad. I didn't want to go because I was the mama's boy. I'm just yeah. keeping it real. I was the mama's boy. Yeah. My dad was like a drill sergeant. So I transitioned from the urban schools, the hood, you would say, and I tra tra transitioned to the suburbs uh -huh. and the white gated community and the guarded gated you know community and everything kind of changed for me at that point i went from 50 cent snicker bars to a dollar snicker bars <laughs> so everything kind of doubled and then the yeah. same thing happened again i already knew exactly what i had to do so i got people to sell candy for me i got six people to help me sell candy in the, in the high school and the teachers, I mean, the principals used to come and say, Smith, we got another one of your workers. And like, and they used to always come and get me and she used to mess with me. They called her Big Bird. They used, she used to always come mess with me and tell me how she just caught one of my workers. And they, and I used to go to, to su suspension. It was like, bro, what happened? It's like, man, they got me. So I was like, where the candy at? They got the candy. I was like, oh man. So I go to the office and I see my bag with my merchandise yeah. gone. And they're passing around my Snicker bars and my m &Ms. You want a Snicker bar? And I'm furious. Yeah. They're giving away my product. Yeah. And then they seen how much money I was making. And then they added vending machines. Yeah. They added vending machines. They did that to my brother. By the way, my brother did the same thing in high school. Oh and he God. and I'm, I'm almost nine years older than him. So I'm like, yeah, get that money. And the principal, he got in trouble for it. I'm like, you can't be doing this. You can't be selling. Like, you're, you're taking away from the school, you know, the cafeteria. And I'm like, 
that it's free market. Screw that. <laughs> they can't monopolize it. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> That's what they did. And then they, when they put the vending machines there, I started fighting back. So I started stuffing stuff in paper in the quarter slots so they could, so they couldn't get in and i used yeah. to pay people to go stuff the slots <laughs> and then and then they, they they figured out what i was doing and then they put a camera there <laughs> they put a camera there and then that's when that's that's when it was game over for me i couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> there goes that's me. when i officially went out of business but then my dad he had a record label and he had some cds in the garage five thousand cds are the hottest artist in miami his business went out of his, his company went out of business yep. and i took those same cds and i went and i and i put i had uh that's when they had cd players yeah and I played their best three songs and i say listen if you listen to 30 give me 30 seconds i used to walk up to random people give me 30 seconds and if you listen to this song if you don't like it you'll never got to hear from me again but if you like it you give me five dollars man we sold we sold like it was 13 boxes of like I think it was 2000 CDs per box. And I got those guys who was helping me sell candy have, they sold every last CD. And my dad came in a, in a, in a garage one day. He was like, did anybody see those CDs that was in here? And I was like, no, nah, what CD? <laughs> that went platinum in the schoolhouse. It was amazing, man. That's but, amazing. That's awesome. And so, uh, and that's when you started pretty Ricky as well, right? That's when you were going with your brother. Yeah. yeah. And so we, tell me about that journey. Yeah, so we I was in Pretty Ricky from like eighth grade, I think eighth and ninth grade, and my dad made me get in a group, and from that we was performing every day, and we performed so many times that they used to mention our name, and women used to run up to the stage, girls used to run up to the stage because they just said our name, Pretty Ricky about the, they, our name was Pretty Ricky and the Mavericks, Pretty Ricky and the Mavericks about to perform, and they'll run to the stage. And it will go crazy. And my dad, he understood the reciprocation rule. So he used to tell people when they wanted to book us, he would do them a favor and let us perform for free. Even though we could have got paid for performing, he said, nah, get them on the stage and I'll do it for free. So we end up with two to three shows every single day. Wow. On the weekends. Yeah. So Friday, two shows. Saturday, two shows, Sunday, three shows. It was, it was like that. And we perform every single day to work on our craft. Was it just around Miami or? It was, or it was the whole Florida. We used to drive up to Jacksonville. We used to drive up to, to, um, to Orlando, Miami. We used to go to New York. Like it was crazy. It was crazy. And we was just, you know, we was just per perfecting our craft. Yeah. And that's when we understood practice made perfect because we perform literally every day, just, just practicing so yep. on the weekend we was already primed up ready to go and every time we perform we got two more shows three more shows yep. two more shows three more shows so somebody was always in the audience wanting to book us like oh, how can we do how can i book y'all and we my dad used to say the same thing hey put us on the stage we got you and was his thought that your guys are going to get better and better and eventually start charging or was it to sell records like what was the thesis I think, his, I think his goal was to put us in front of as many people as possible he knew that if we got in front of the people, we was going to turn them into fans. And that's yep. exactly what happened. And we we was a great performing group before we even had music. So we was already known for our shows before we even had a hit record. So when we had the hit record, it just added the icing on the cake. Got it. And so, yeah, tell me about that. Like, how old were you when you had the hit record? I literally graduated. As soon as I graduated, and I was like, oh, man. High school or middle school? I been high school, like high school graduated. Yeah. I was like, man, imagine if my song would have came out when I was in high school. That would have been amazing. Yeah. But, but yeah, as soon as I graduated in 2005, the song came out, and it blew up. You know, nice. and radio station in Miami, Florida was Power 96. They played it one time a day, and it became the number one most requested record in the history of the whole radio station and they requested it so much it became number one and then the ceo of atlanta records came down and he asked the program director which is the person in charge of putting music to the for the radio station say who who is the next thing out of miami and it was like man you got to meet these guys pretty ricky and yeah. we ended up setting up a meeting he hid in the bushes and he wanted to see how he was walking what was our swag like this is what he told us and i'm like yeah. is that serious made us perform. He made us perform in a hotel room. He was like, yo, perform for me. 
we was like, Psh, say, say no more. Yeah. You did this three times a day. You're good. So yeah. On, like, let's go, man. We yeah. rocked it so hard. He was, he pulled out a contract. He tried to sign us on the spot. My yeah. dad said, no, no, no. You know, let's, 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 you know, let's look at the paperwork. Yeah. And, and we smart. had some, more, we had some more shows. Martin Luther King parade was coming up and Craig Cowman. We didn't sign the paperwork yet. We were still working that out. And he was supposed to fly in from New York to come see us perform. So we performed, it was like 50,000 people. It's Martin Luther King Parade. It's like the biggest parade in Miami. And yep. we performed. And when we performed, we at the last song, our record was called Grind On Me. And when that record came on, the girls went crazy. It like erupted in the, in the <laughs> audience. And we got into the middle of the song. And the, we had, it was two stories. The girls climbed up the barricade, <laughs> was climbing up. They was climbing up on top of each other, coming. And they rushed the stage. We had to run from the back of the stage. We had to jump in the truck. And they they was like, they literally pulled my brother. His old eyes looked like it was going to pop out the socket. They grabbed him. <laughs> He jumped in the truck. Everybody jumped in the truck. They was on top of the truck. And literally, we was driving off. They chased us for like three blocks. So now yep. that's not even the end of the story. This is the final finale. <laughs> so now Craig Cowman finally comes in. And we was like, was he there? Was he there? He missed the show. Oh, so wow. now we have the second show. Now, he missed it. Now, as an artist, your main thing as an artist, you want to get signed. Signed no. to a major label. You want to go platinum. You want to tour the world. Like, that's the goal of an artist. No, he didn't. He didn't make it. We felt like we we was devastated. I mean, we was okay. devastated because we never seen that like happen to that capacity. So yeah. it was like, all right, cool. Our second show. Remember, I told you we always have two shows. So our second show come is raining outside. <sighs> Somebody's on the stage. They ran everybody off. The little people that was out there, they were singing. <laughs> we're in the middle of a park in a trailer, like a trailer built, a stage built, like a trailer stage. And now Craig Cowman pulls up. We like, oh my God, don't tell how is he here? We yeah. ain't got nobody out there. Like, it's nothing. It's nobody. Man, they said Pretty Ricky and the Mavericks coming up to the stage. It's raining now. Yeah. When girls came out of nowhere, ran towards the <laughs> stage. We stopped performing. By the time we finished performing, it was over 200 girls out in the front of the stage in the middle of this park out of nowhere. We out there rocking. We going, we doing our thing. We just going crazy. And now Craig Cowman on the stage. So now I look at my brothers and grind on me. Come on. We on the stage. I look at them and we run to the truck. They open the truck though. We dive in the truck. Yeah. They rush us, they rush us and watch us like run towards the truck. They jump in, they start, we close the door. They start chasing us for three blocks. They yeah. knock Craig Cowman over. My dad seen him get on the phone. He said, give them whatever they want. Give them whatever <laughs> they want. Deal signed. We got signed in January, February, we did the album. March, we, the album, we put out the album. We sold 30,000 albums every single week, all the way to platinum. Wow. Grind on went platinum. Your body went platinum. We sold 6 million ringtones. Like, phenomenal. I remember the ringtone era. That's awesome. So that was, you said 2006, right? That was 2005 to 2006. In 2009, we came out with on the hotline, which was another platinum album, uh, platinum single. And then we came out with the album that was number one on the Billboard charts for five consecutive weeks on the hip hop and r and charts. Wow. And so first off, like, how was that experience? Everybody, all, you know, that's like, everybody wants to know behind the scenes of, you know, having the platinum artist life. Like, how was that period of like 2006 to let's say 2010? Well, the period was, it was a, it was an amazing period because it was feel good music. We was yep. young, we was having fun. We was having fun with the women. They was having fun with us. And, you know, it was an experience, right? Yeah. And, but we, but I wasn't handling my, my finances. So that's when things kind of went left for me. So uh -huh. imagine touring the world <clears throat> and having one credit card that one person in the group control and you had to ask him for whatever, ask him for things that you needed. And if he told you, no, you couldn't get it. And who was that that had control? It was Baby Blue. He was the main person that had the control of the money because that's who my dad trusted because he was the label owner and the manager at the same time. But my dad made some poor decisions with the money. Yeah. Had poor decisions with relationships and the label. And we went flat broke. 
So why, and that, that's sadly not an uncommon story. So like, I would love to know more about that. Like what, ha- what were those poor decisions? Like what happened? Cause I, I assume the label did pay you money. Like they gave you an advance. They gave you some money. You yeah. obviously made money. You went multiple platinum. Sure. Uh, so what happened? Like, where did that money go? So the money went in places that it shouldn't have went. I think he invested in like some office spaces. He, he, he did other investments. You think he gambled some money. Like it was, it was a few things that he did. And yeah. With the label, the label wanted to put out one of the singers by himself. But the reason why they wanted to put one of the singers out that was in the group was because my dad was mismanaging the money. He wasn't paying the singer. And the singer was like, you know what? I'm out. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm out. I, I'm not getting no money. I'm not I'm not really a child like that. But I'm living with you and we're trying to build this vision. But you're not paying me. I got a kid. I need money. I want to move the way I want to move. He didn't pay nobody. And the singer left. Yeah. And the label tried to reconcile. Oh, no. What, what do you call it? Like reconcile? Yeah. Reconcile the, the relation. That's what you call it, right? I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I had to reconcile a relationship. And when he tried to do that, they got into it with my father because he didn't want the group to split. He right. didn't want the solo artist and then the group. He wanted everybody together, which is fair because we was his kids. And yeah. the singer wasn't really his child like that, but we grew up together. So we got into a big argument with the label. We got into a lawsuit. The label locked us out of all our social media accounts. I was behind all the social media, like literally number one on MySpace, because that was the main thing out at the time. We yeah. was number one on YouTube. We had literally badges next to our name on the most viewed video, the most subscribers. Like we was the number one group. When we did stuff, we crashed over servers. Yeah. But he didn't do the right thing. The group ended up splitting. We mm-hmm. end up by ourselves, independent. We got released from the label. What year was that? I think it was around like 2009, 2010. Yeah. And from that point, it was such a huge up uphill battle trying to fight the label, spend so much money doing it. Yeah. And throughout that process of trying to fight the label, our money got lower and lower and lower and lower. And my dad didn't really understand the politics of the music industry. He didn't understand the corporate world. So he ended up, he ended up getting chewed up by the corporate world. You know, it's different from streets and it's it's different from streets and and corporate. It's two totally separate situations. And I feel like he didn't align himself with Alliance that was going to come to his beck and call or, or his support and be that support system. If things hit the fan. Right. So it was, it was like before everybody was by themselves, like G unit didn't do no collaborations with nobody. It was just G unit did G unit. So yeah. right. Cash money did cash money songs. And that was just it. No limit did no limit songs. And it was no collaboration. So we never had, we never built out those artists in that support system that was going to support us through those hard times. Yeah. It was just him. It was just family and him. And, and the reality is he never really built a real business in terms of employees. Yep. We all know you earn, you, you run your business. I run my yep. business. You need the best talent. Yeah. The best talent is your friends and your family. There's no way we can get to a hundred million dollar company. Right. Not saying it's not possible, but nine out of 10, you ain't making it there. Right. Unless you get super lucky where your friends and family just happen to be the most, the brightest the operators star. ever. Yeah. Yep. So exactly. that's what, that's that 1% I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. So he didn't have that and not to take no credit from my brother and like what we was doing, but mm-hmm. we wasn't on a superstar level that we could have took the business to the next level. He got us here, but he couldn't get us there. Right. And that was the issue. So he got chewed up. Bad, bad decisions. He didn't have nobody mentoring him. Yeah. It was all based on what he knew, the streets, and everything was from the muscle with him. Yeah. And that's why he got chewed up. And in return, I got chewed up because he was managing all my money right. at the same time. <clears throat> yeah. And so at that point, you're what, 23, 24 years old? I think, how, how old was I? Do Graduated I know- 05, so you're 18 and 05. Is that right? Yeah, 18, 18 and 05. And so you're 20, 22, 23. Right. So when things really hit the fan on try to make things work, and because yeah. once we went kind of, once we went broke, 
<clears throat> I still had to figure out how to, I still had to figure out how to transition from being an artist and my music career flatlining and trying for years to try to revive it at 28 was that breaking point for me when I was like, you know what? I'm staying with my father. I'm trying to work this out. I don't want to leave my family behind. This is a vision we had together. I don't want to jump ship just because things are getting rough. But at some point, I got a transition. My dad got mad at me one day after like we we was about to lose the house. And he was like, yo, he just started yelling at me. It was, it was a situation where we wanted to get a certain artist on the record and he didn't like that person. We was going through financial troubles and he told me, get out of his house. He kicked me out. He said, wow. get the F out my house. I had no clothes, I had no money, I had nothing. He just told me leave, wouldn't even let me come in the house. And that's when I transitioned from doing what I was doing as a side hustle with social media, getting into that to getting kicked out and being forced to make something happen because I didn't have nowhere to go. My, my fiance mom at the time, she was my girlfriend told me I could come and stay with her for six months until I can figure out things. Mm -hmm. And that's very nice. I took six months and I got my stuff together. I started my business and I started my business, not even having an address to put it in. And <laughs> I started it and, and I freaking went crazy, man. I, I got a call from Maddie J a guy named Matty J and he told me I could make money off of social media and I took it serious. I was like, all right, if this is the way, then let me figure out a way to make this the best situation possible for me. Mm -hmm. And I started figuring out strategies to grow social media following. Mm -hmm. I figured out strategy to, to, to make as much money as possible by monetizing, doing traffic acquisition, doing sponsor posts. I figured out every last way that not only I can build digital real estate, but also how I can actually monetize that real estate through different type of strategies on making money through social media. And so, and that was like, again, 2010, you're talking about is when you got into that or is that what? Yeah, at that point I was 28. Yeah, I, okay. Okay. yeah around that time. Yep, correct. And then, and so it, it says it in all your bio that everything. So at what point did you discover Grumpy Cat? And did that start happening? So Grumpy Cat was around that whole, whole parody stage was yep. seeing like different, different things that would hit. And then Grumpy Cat was a point, was, was a situation where it was, it was a 80, 20 situation. So I lived my whole life on 80, 20, 20%, you know, as uh, of the things that you're doing right? It's going to bring you 80% of the revenue. So yeah, I kind of yeah. switched that whole model and say, listen, I'm going to focus on this 20%, this 20% and put it to the 80%. Focus yeah. on that as the 80%. And now my test was the grumpy cat. That was the test. Yeah, right? yeah. That was the test. Like, uh, let me go ahead and throw that out there. And I started focusing on everything else I had going on. Yeah. And how'd you meet that cat? Like it wasn't your cat, right? No, no. The, the cat was named, the owner name is Tabitha. Yeah. And the cat name is Tatar, right? Tar yeah. is the cat. Seen yeah. cat, looked at it and was like, man, this thing could go crazy. At the yeah. time I was building other brands and other and other parody accounts and things like that. Seen the cat and boom, blew that thing up like crazy. It went viral. And man, it, it was it was sky's the limit from there. The, clack, the cat blew up and yeah. it was it was history. It became one of the yeah. most famous animals on the planet. Yep. Yeah. And, and so and were, how, how'd you work that deal? I'm curious, like you, were they already going viral or did you jump in like before you just saw the cat and it wasn't really a thing? Like, the cat, it wasn't nothing. And, and, yeah. and what happened was I didn't know much at the time yeah. about business like that. So I never really got a chance to really get the money like I was supposed to yeah. because they trademarked it on me. I didn't get a chance to trademark it like yeah. I was supposed to. I didn't yeah. trademark it. I didn't like, they, they kind of seen what I was doing and then like, basically took over what I was doing and tried to wipe me out the whole situation because yeah, I was yeah. there. And since they was the owner of the cat and they had more business sense than me, like yeah. I didn't know I was just a, another young kid just trying to, you know, make something pop on the internet and make some money. Yeah. And it went from that to them overtaking everything I had going on. They deleted my page. They got my page deleted. Like they was fighting me at yeah. that point. And I was just like, well, damn, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I'm over here just trying to make money because I'm homeless at this point. Right. I'm just yeah. trying to make the money. And, uh, and it blew up. The cat blew up. Uh, I did make money off the cat, but they made the real money because they yeah. in 
trademarking it and everything like that. And from them trademarking it, they took my my Twitter account out because yeah. I had trademark. They had the trademark and they, you know, they basically yeah. sat the engine on the cat at that point because they took over the business of it. So yeah. there was nothing I can do. It's yeah. no is equivalent to somebody starting something and getting something going and somebody see what you're doing and jump on it. And since you know, they they was the people who who really have the cat. It's like yeah. I'ma fight the cat. Like it's, yeah. it's really you're the owner of the physical cat, but not not of the brand. But then you end up taking the brand because now you copyright you you copyright the brand. So that was yeah. just that was just a, a lesson for me. And and I still get to say that I'm a part of that whole situation, but in reality, it was a lesson learned for me and my future ventures on how to do business. When I do something, make sure that I am crossing my T's and dotting my I's, because yep. you're gonna end up with nothing based off of all your efforts. Yep, people love to take advantage. Um, so take me through, so that so what happened after that? You started building out the social media. You've obviously, you've gone, seeing that you're sitting in your backyard right now and it looks pretty beautiful. You've had a big step from being homeless. So what, take me through what happened next. <laughs> yeah, so it started from that to me doing the same thing I did with the candy business. Yeah. And that it was a problem in the industry, which was people knew how to make money off of social media, but they didn't know how to make money how I knew how to make money. Because everything with me, my personality is if I do something, I want to cover every last base. And not only cover every last base, I literally want to be the best at it. And I'm gonna do everything and I at I'm gonna do everything in my power, everything I can to be number one. And they had a leaderboard, so I even had motivation. So it was a website called mylikes.com. And that was the traffic source of the that was the that was the traffic, that was the way that I can utilize my traffic to make money off their advertisers. So I signed up as a publisher and I had this board. It was over. 30,000 people that was pushing for that number one spot. And I did what I could to get it. And that's what happened. I ended up at the number one spot. So on the leaderboard, you can see what everybody's making. You can see who's number one, who's number two, and number three. And I got all those screenshots and everything, right? That you can see number one, number one, number one. And you make, you got $150 if you hit number one, $50 if you hit number two. Yeah. Right? And you get iPads and all the extra stuff. So I had even the sinners on top of it, just having to drive to be number one. Yeah. So I went to everybody that was top 10 and I say, listen, you would never beat me. I will always be right there at that number one spot. But this is what we can do. Why compete with each other? We can all come together. So this is what I want to, this is my suggesting. My suggesting, my suggesting, my suggestion, yeah. <laughs> suggesting, all right, yeah. is to come in and help you build your social media. Mm hmm and monetize it, but instead of you being number two, I'm gonna build you up to number one status. Well, I'm gonna build on top of the revenue that you would have that you wouldn't have made, and I'm gonna grow the pages faster than you would have ever grew it. Yeah. So I started working on all these rev share deals with the top 10 pages, and yeah. I started sweet man. I start I 10x everything they had going on. Yeah, everything they had I 10x their followers, I 10x their income. I was freaking smashing it for them, and yeah. then it gave me the idea of okay. If I'm doing this for different parody accounts, different fan accounts on Twitter, imagine if I did this with celebrities who yeah. already have millions of followers. It took me three, four years to get six million followers. Yeah. What if I just go to the celebrity that already have six million followers, 10 million, 20 million, 15 million, and just work out a rev shut deal? They have a page. They don't know how to monetize just sitting there. They don't care. Yeah. So I'm going to come in with a solution to that problem. The problem is they're this influencer or celebrity, I would say, that put in all this work, build this fan base up, but they hit record, fizzled out, and now they're broke. Yeah. So not only I wanted to help these celebrities that was dead in the water, revive them based on the skill set that I already had that I proved that I can do for multiple people, and let me do this for them. Not only I can help them provide for their family, they can make more money based off their past efforts. Yep. I can still make money as a business model. So I started signing these people. I signed Jay Holiday. I signed Sean Kingston, T-Pain, Bone Thugs and Harmony. I started signing all these different talented people. And I started running their social media account. Fat Joe, 
freaking you name them, I had them. Yeah. So the boy, Sean Kingston, all these people. And I started making the money, $50,000 a month, $40,000 a month, $30,000 a month, to the point where I got over 100 celebrities I was managing their social media account. And you were just getting them like endorsement deals through social, that side of things? Web share, yeah. traffic acquisition. Oh, nice. Selling, selling traffic, uh, selling uh, advertisement against the traffic I was sending. Did you have Ludacris? I remember him promoting a bunch of stuff. Ludacris, I never got Ludacris. Okay. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he, was, he was to my competitor. Got it. But I had a lot of people. Yeah, no. And the, and, the, and the thing that I did that they couldn't do, I knew how to grow the social media following. They only yeah. knew how to milk it, monetize, right? Yeah. And when they milked it dry and it was no yeah. more milk, yeah. they was dead in the water. My yeah. page literally went from a million followers to 10 million, uh, yeah. 2 million followers to 8 million. Like I took a guy named Kevin Gates from a million followers to, to 12 million followers. No. 10 million followers. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And so, and, and that's where you started making that real money. Cause I'm assuming you took a decent cut of all that revenue, right? It was a 50, 50 split. Yeah. That's huge. Um, that's great. Um, and for why not? They weren't making any money off it themselves. Yeah. Like I, I I've done a ton in that space. And like what you see, like what their actual agent does is we're going to do all this other stuff and you're going to pay us for this and we'll throw in a social media post. So it was always just like the carrot on like, yeah, sure. We'll throw that in too. Like it's not a big deal for them. They didn't think they could at that point in time, it wasn't a big thing. They didn't care because it was literally like some old dusty shoes that you never wore. You didn't care about it. Nobody cared about Facebook. So us milking the cow was, was amazing for them. And then Facebook realized how much money we was making. So they tried to cut us out. Yeah. Man, they making so much money off of this same vending machine thing to me all over again. Yeah. <laughs> how much money I was making, they was like, okay, we need to do something. So they created something called instant articles. If yeah. plot didn't work, they realized they couldn't beat us. So they sub- they cut our water off. Yeah. They pressed the type of articles that would make money and the type of posts that would make money in feed. So they built the algorithm yeah. and and they took their, their AI. Yeah. And from the AI, they suppressed every single post that would make money from the feed. So no matter yeah. if you had 10 million followers, if you post a certain type of post, nobody um, would do it. You would get yeah. 100 people to see that post. Yeah. And they put a lot of people out of business. And yeah. that's, the, that's the main thing that I learned in business. You have to pivot. Same yeah. way I, I was selling candy and they took me out of business and I started selling CDs. Yeah. I took same model. It's like, okay, yeah. you know what? I was in third grade. I sold candy bars and they gave yeah. me some, a bull crap prize. I opened up shop by myself and start selling my own candy. Well, and what's cool about that also is you learned you can take your infrastructure and pivot it too. So like you had those sellers that were selling for you that you taught, you took them with you. So you didn't have to start from scratch. You just had to pivot the product. And I think a lot of people miss that. You didn't have to like shut down and open up. You just change direction. So I that's the direction, pivot. and what I did was I took what I was doing for celebrities and yeah. I started doing it for the everyday entrepreneur. Yeah. I started doing it for the everyday entrepreneur, the everyday business owner that had the great greatest product, the greatest story, but didn't know how to get it to the masses. So I yeah. started helping people go viral and become famous by using mm-hmm. social media to increase their followers in their network. And, and what year was that that you started doing that? That was in 2014, I'm thinking. Okay. So early. This is like... That's around the time that I guess Gary Vaynerchuk started to really be on the scene. Like that's right in that period. Like he wasn't, he had his wine library, but he didn't, that like entrepreneur as a celebrity thing had really was getting started 2012, 2014. Yep. 2014. I was killing it before then I was doing all Twitter pages, murdering it. And I was doing it for myself for a while. So I got my page up to, I got my page up to like 50, 60,000 a month. Uh-huh. And then that was like my test phase where I was just testing it out to make sure it worked because I did it for the Twitter pages, but then I wanted to test it out for myself to make sure I had a proven model that was bulletproof. So when I onboard these celebrities, it's already game over. Yep. And I just got them, I signed them and I took it to the next level. But what hap- what was happening was the people that was in the, the business before me, because when I got in, I realized there's more people in there. It wasn't yep. just me. Yep. And I had competitors. And what the competitors do, they would come in and they would go with the competitors. Yep. They wouldn't go with the black man with the, you know, I just, I was the artist and nobody took me serious. It's just what it was. Yeah. And they didn't go with me. So I created a blue ocean strategy. I took everything from 
the music industry that I knew it was a great asset and I pivoted to another industry similar to the way that the 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 actual uh fast food rest the, the bank seen the fast food restaurants with the drive throughs and they decided that they yeah. wanted to do the drive throughs I don't know if it was the reverse I don't know if the the fast no, I think food you're right yeah right so yeah so the bank seen the fast food restaurants say hey we can do the same thing so yeah. that's the same thing I did I took it from I took it from having a a advance from the music industry and I created advances for this social media space. So I would come with an advance and they would have to recoup their money from that advance. So yeah. I'll sign them up front like, hey, I give you $50,000 right up front. Yeah. And if you sign with me, you just recoup this money. You should get yeah. your money back full recoup after two months. So yeah. my advance was based on how much money I can make in two months. Yeah. So that I would make my money back in two months. They would be happy. And then they started, they started literally copycatting me, my competitors. Yeah. But what I did was I added another layer. I say I will put a guarantee. See, because I knew how to grow yep. followers. So yep. since I knew how to grow followers, the more followers you have, the more money you make. Yep. So I knew how to grow the followers. So every month my money was increasing for them. They yep. just knew how to make the money, but then they, they didn't know the strategy and the proven system that I developed on how to grow a following no matter who you are. You can be Joe Smo yep. and grow your followers from zero. Yep. And and when I utilized that, I started doing minimums. And that's when that's when they actually had something that that um that that went to the next level because when I when I implemented that strategy, they went out of business. They started yeah. seeing guys like Kevin Hart and all this and started giving them guarantees and stuff like <laughs> that. And when they started giving them guarantees, when they started giving them guarantees, they literally went out of business because exactly. they couldn't fulfill that because they was yeah. trying to copy me and what I was doing. Yeah. And they all went out of business trying to copy copycat me. And yep. that's that that's when I, I stayed afloat and I kept doing my thing. Nice. And so and when did you when did that last or is that what you're still doing? No, I, I transitioned from that to understanding that it wasn't a scalable business model for me to help as many people as possible. I couldn't help, right. I couldn't help the masses. So I was yep. going around, I was going around having having all of these different um all these different people that I was onboarding as a service, but my business will only scale up as furthest as as fast as I can actually get clients or and I or, or hire staff. So what I decided to do to help as many people as possible, I decided to actually come in and create an online business school. Where now I can literally take all of these people who couldn't afford to pay me my my rate that I was charging every single month for them to invest on on building their brands up on social media and monetizing. Yep. I decided to just take everything and put it in video video modules. Where now, no matter who you are, what you're doing, I'm gonna give you literally an MBA of what it takes to have a successful business, a successful seven figure business. Everything that you need from what the hell do you do with the operation system? Yeah. Right? How do I, what, what, what do I do to have a great operation system that can sustain a seven figure business? Yeah. Right? Accountability, right? Issues, goal setting. All right. What is that? Boom. I put that in the program. Okay. I figured out, all right, what do you got to do to actually build your brand up? You need certain things to build your brand up. You need to know how to, your colors, you need to know fonts. You need to know, you need to know certain things on how to build your brand up. What's your, what's your voice? What's your mission statement? What's your core values? Like build all that stuff up. And then marketing, you need to know Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Yeah. If you don't know ads, you will literally go broke, right? Yeah. If you learn how to do advertisement, you will never go broke. You'll eat yeah. for a lifetime. And yep. I decided I was tired of giving people fish. I wanted to teach them how to fish. So I literally built a curriculum from top to bottom on everything they needed from credit, building their credit up to marketing, to, to affiliates, to building their products, the everything you can think yep. of on having a real, what I call an MBA degree, Mastering Business Affluence. Yeah, That's what I built a program around that main program on somebody coming in executing and that's why i went to harvard we was talking about harvard i yeah. wanted to figure out their system i was yeah. going to create my school i'm a i'm a true believer and not reinventing the wheel 100 percent. success leave clues so i went to harvard to figure out how was the professors teaching how was how was their breakout rooms how was the they, all right they're teaching on case studies so now i added case studies like yeah. i basically took everything i could from a proven system, bring it back to my school. And, yeah. and now I can put it in a way where they can dissect it 
and and really be able to execute on the things that I'm saying and replace professors because I've seen an issue with that. I don't believe I believe somebody can only take you as further as they that as further as they took themselves. Yeah. That's what I believe, right? And 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 I'm a true believer in you can get faster to a place where you want to go if somebody already been there. So yeah. I decided to replace professors with millionaire mentors on top of me leading the pack as the right. main. Mentor. Awesome. And so uh, three more questions for you. Number one, where did your success really take off? Like, is, is it Adwazar? Is it Wiser? Sorry, how do you pronounce it? You, you said you like one of the only people say it right. But yeah, Adwazar. Yep. Adwazar. Cool. Perfect. I didn't want to say it wrong. And so um, has that been the most successful endeavor for you? Was it Pretty Ricky? Was it the social media? Like, where did you really hit a level of success that you felt comfortable? You're good personally kind of thing. Well, I would say my online business school because that that's what fulfilled me the most. Yeah. Get the most enjoyment out of it. I think that's the, that's where the real equity come from. That's that's the real success and the impact. That so I here, impact. here's the here's question because it comes up a lot recently. So if someone came in and wanted to buy it right now, do you think you'd sell it? I don't feel like I'm where I need to be at. So I wouldn't sell yep. it. Yep. I, feel like I'd be short, I would be cutting myself short. Yep. Cool. That's what I hope to hear. And I like that. So it's funny. People always think like selling a business is some, is the goal. And sometimes you're like, no, no, no. Like I'm good. We're, we're I'm building this. This is, I don't need to just dump it. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So two last questions. What's next for you? Yeah. Where, do you? where do you want to take it? So it's a few things. So for Awazar, my next, my next strategy for Awazar is a franchise model. Uh-huh. And the reason why I want to create the franchise model and the reason why I'm working on that right now is because I have my students at Spectacular Academy. They're learning the business tools, everything they need to launch a successful business, but they're focusing on their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So now I want to take those certain students and then elevate them to the franchise model with Adwazar because now they don't have to do no guessing. Mm -hmm. They don't have to figure out how they're going to do their marketing because we're going to help them with marketing. They don't have to figure out how to brand themselves because I was already have a Inc. 5000 brand. So you already have that. And all you have to do is service the client. Yeah. That's it. Manage and service the client. I'm going to give you every template, every tool. I'm going to be the person who help you market it with commercials. So I'm going to be a Jared of Subway and nice. I'm going to freaking murder it for you on, on, on getting you leads we're going to build out a system. I'm even thinking about building out a sales system for them and doing a webinar for each niche. So yep. you don't even have to worry about even doing the sales. You yep. simply, all you got to do is service the client. Yeah, right? which is huge. A lot and of people don't have that sales and marketing skill. And if they can just service and get that help, they can be successful it. too, which is great. That's it. And you just pay the franchise fee and I'm going to create more millionaires than McDonald's. McDonald's have 30, 38,000 freaking locations so that's thirty-eight thousand millionaires and wow. that's my goal i'm gonna create yeah. more millionaires than mcdonald's that's amazing i love that and so last question i uh, always love to ask what's one piece of advice for someone just getting going that wants to achieve those dreams i mean the, your your story is awesome it's incredible like how many different sort of stages and phases of you've had at a young age like what would you recommend to someone that's just getting going that's like i want to achieve my dreams i've got dreams that i want to make big i think honestly man get around people that believe in you that think highly of you. And even if you decide that you want to quit, you got people that's going to push you over that limit and tell you, nah, you tripping. Get up, you got this. And that's the really the key to everything because at any point of time, you could either be one mistake away from bankruptcy or no. one mistake away from just quitting and deciding you don't want to do it no more. The day that you gave up could have been a day that you made it. So keeping that support system, joining organizations, no matter if it's a mastermind, no matter if it's a school, like I got 7,000 students, they all get to literally network with each other because you have an entryway, you have yeah. a better entry, which is a price point already. So they can come into it knowing that this person is already this, this much committed. Yeah. So the higher up the totem pole you go with commitment and investing in yourself, the more quality people you're going to get around. So I think proximity is everything. That's what's going to motivate you. That's what's going to push you. And that's what's going to get you to the limits you want. <clears throat> and then understanding that it's not a box. People say, think inside, think outside the box. Yeah. Guess what? It ain't no box. What yeah. box? I don't even yeah. know what box you're referring to. Right? Yeah. Because if somebody looked at me, they would say, oh, Spec, he'll be an a, a entrepreneur as a kid. Like, okay, stick him in the entrepreneur bucket. 
Oh, stick him in a dancer bucket. He started yeah. up in a dance group. Make him a dancer. No. Oh, he's a rapper now. No, stick him in the rapper bucket. Yeah. No, he's not a rapper no more. Okay, he's back an entrepreneur. Stick him in an entrepreneur bucket. Oh, yeah. no, he's an agency owner. Just make him an agency owner. No, okay. Oh, th- he's doing a school now. Yeah. It ain't no box. You can do Amen. whatever you decide you want to do. Is literally all it takes is you being persistent and consistent and building the right relationships that's that you can foster to get you to where you need to go because that's the formula that's literally going to get you there. Self education is key, and relationships are key, and being and being self motivated and and doing everything in your heart to build up others around you. If you make enough people millionaires, you in return will become a millionaire. Amen, Spec. That was awesome. Totally agree. And thank you so much for coming on Hawk Talk, man. Yes, sir. And listen, for everybody that want to reach me, man, you guys can go to spectacularmasterclass.com. Check it out. It's a three-hour workshop. You can join it. It's free. I only have so much time here. And for those who do have questions for me or anything like that, you guys can literally text me 786-661-1224 or literally Text me the hashtag masterclass if you want me to personally send you the link. But regardless, it was great to be on here. It's always great talking to you. I love what you're doing at your company. Keep killing it over there, man. And if you need me, I'm here for you. Perfect. Me too, man. Thanks again. We'll talk soon. You've been listening to the Hawk Media Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.